1997, Peter Molyneux was doing quite well for himself. The company he had founded, Bullfrog Productions, had found incredible success, and he popularized the god game genre with one of his early successes in Populous. He created an internationally popular theme park simulator in Theme Park World, alongside other huge hits like Magic Carpet and the soon-to-be-finished Dungeon Keeper. Even with such success, he was unsatisfied. Bullfrog had been purchased by Electronic Arts, and he was unhappy with management exerting control and limiting his ambition. Sounds familiar, right? With how large and unwieldy the development team of Bullfrog had become, he felt as though he had been losing the creative control that he thought was needed to get his ambitious ideas out the door. Tensions continued to rise, and in a moment of catharsis during a night of drinking with his friend Tim Rance, Peter had typed out a letter of resignation. What he didn't count on was that his friend Rance would then send that resignation to EA before he could stop him. EA would then ban him outright from the Bullfrog offices, only letting him communicate with his team through email to finish the work on Dungeon Keeper. This funny anecdote would mark the end of his time at Bullfrog, but the beginning of a new era. For Molyneux, this would bring incredible highs and even lower lows. After work on Dungeon Keeper was completed, Peter would leave Bullfrog officially and would form a studio initially named Red Eye, named for the flights he and Rance had just returned from. Though eventually they landed on Lionhead after Bullfrog alum and new co-founder Mark Webley's pet hamster. Webley later referred to this as a death wish, as the titular hamster passed away shortly after. With their hamster sacrifice complete, Lionhead was open and Molyneux already had an idea for the first game. A game that would go through the cycle of hype, acclaim, reappraisal, and eventually forgotten by the world. Black and White's development was described as chaotic. There were no producers, no scheduling, or anything resembling organization or planning. But despite that, those who had worked on it described the atmosphere was above all else creative. A boys club filled with grueling long 15-hour days, Peter had set out to create something that's never been done before. A cross between his previous game ideas and pet simulators that were popular at the time. One of the biggest sources of inspiration was his Tamagotchi that he had become enamored with, even wearing it on a chain around his neck. In an article written for GameDeveloper.com, he described wanting to make a game where the player was more in control and could do what they want, when they wanted, without a clunky user interface, ruining the immersion, and with the creature that could grow to a massive size, develop its own personality, and help the player when needed, using AI more advanced than what was available up to that point. The development team started out as small as 9 people, steadily growing to a max of 25 to keep the team spirit intact, and to prevent the team from becoming as large and unwieldy as the games Molyneux was making at Bullfrog. At this point in Molyneux's career, he was well respected and seen as an ambitious visionary dreamer, instead of the negative reputation he is given now. But the cracks did start to appear. He was a popular figure who many fans were creating massive hype cycle for with each new release, including fan sites that would post about features he had not shown, lead to accusations of overpromising, which is a word that would follow Peter in the many years to come. Fans flocked just to see some very early screenshots at E3 1999, but if you want to see how Black and White was truly coming along, then look no further than Game Development Conference 2000, where Peter showed the world what Black and White would be all about. The conference had Molyneux bristling with nervous enthusiasm for the project he was spending $6 million of his own money on. Nervous because he knew it was not a stable build, even telling the crowd that it will crash. Yet, he was excited because what he was about to show was compelling and new. He shows off slides that would fit a college class presentation, showing the goals of development and how they compared to previous games he had worked on, with the main emphasis being it had to impress, it had to be simple to play, it had to have a story that people care about, and it had to use state-of-the-art technology. The following slides featured other goals central to the core design of the game, interaction like a kid's sandbox, a creature that is uniquely yours, and an emotional story. It is clear the main emphasis was giving the player freedom to affect the world to their choosing. 
This kind of access shows how hyped the game was. I mean, they were showing broken builds and how open Lionhead and Molyneux were to giving access to this creative process. As an aside, it is unfortunate yet understandable that we do not get this kind of access anymore. In an era of hypercritical and cynical YouTubers, a fundamental misunderstanding of how game development works, and unfettered capitalism resulting in expensive to develop games that also must be made quickly, has made showing unpolished builds with features that haven't been completely tested a surefire way to get some negative press since the game does not live up to the ambition of the working build. Nobody will learn this lesson harder than Molyneux in future years, but I digress for now. I'll just appreciate that we even got more than this GDC showcase. There was a developer diary written by Lionhead co-founder Steve Jackson on GameSpy. Unfortunately, that section of GameSpy is long gone, and heavy searching on the internet archive ended with only a few entries being found, the rest being lost to time. I'd read these as a kid obsessed with the game, but these seem to have been removed around 2008. What can be gleaned from the pages you can see include what happens when a game reaches its alpha stage and is submitted to the publisher for approval, how the publisher will send back a list of features and bug fixes they want by beta if they even approve the game at all, Peter Molyneux selling someone else's Porsche, yes, I'm serious, and how each physics object had to be tested with each other for hours and hours on end even found an entry about a long-forgotten Winamp plugin that allowed characters and creatures to dance to the music you're playing, and how that came about because everyone was listening to music while developing. And last but not least, a page dedicated to how Microsoft had liked what they had seen from Lionhead and its satellite studios that foreshadowed their eventual purchase of Lionhead. After a lengthy development cycle, Black and White would come out on March 27, 2001, to both critical and commercial acclaim. But I have a couple questions. Did it achieve its design goals they laid out? And more importantly, is it even a good game? To answer these questions, let's get into the real meat and potatoes of how the game is played. In black and white, your godly presence is represented by a hand. That's it, and the game wants you to do everything with it. Click and drag forward and backwards to move, drag the hand to the side of the screen to pan the camera, and use the middle mouse button to zoom and tilt. The bad news is, is that this sucks. But the good news is, is that you can just use the keyboard to move around the map a lot quicker and smoother than just dragging the hand around. You use the hand for every interaction, mainly picking up objects and throwing them, picking up quests, and casting your miracles that you either get through worship or from these one-shot bubbles like these. Worship is done at your temples and requires your people to power them up, either through dancing or sacrifice. Your temple is your representation of your power and your life force. Without it, you cease to exist, and that power is measured through belief. The more people you have and the more villages that worship you, the stronger you are and the wider influence you have. Influence is shown through the lined border. You can't interact with an area if it exists outside your influence, but your creature can. The only way to die, as I said, is to have your temple destroyed, which in practice really only you can do to yourself. The AI is not smart enough to do so. Your temple also acts as your menu system. You can find rooms like a save room, a challenge room which lets you replay quests. There are other rooms, including a room full of in-game statistics about you, a room for your creature where you can see his statistics, what he's learned, how he feels, and even give him some tattoos. The effort into making these rooms feel as grand and immersive as they do while keeping them as effective menus is appreciated. You can even see your villagers walking around in it. What keeps it from being too clunky is a quality autosave feature and the fact that you can just access each room through hotkeys, so they're only a click away. Mechanically, there's a lot to engage with, and unfortunately, black and white tends to hold back at the beginning, and not just for tutorials, which are a constant for the first two lands. Black and white boasts an impressive set of tools to use in later levels, but the campaign fails to give the player opportunity to use them in a way that allows the player the freedom of playstyle that they had boasted about before release, that would, in theory, work for a physics-based god game. The city building serves to boost your ring of influence, but ends up becoming unmanageable and unhappy due to the limited resource systems. The villager AI will deforest an entire area surrounding its town, and there's not much you can do to realistically prevent this, which turns later levels of the game into a slog because wood miracles are much less plentiful. 
You can improve resource miracles through wonders, but these require a lot of wood to build, which leaves you unable to house growing populations and can lead to villages losing belief if left ignored. Villagers have a need system which relies heavily on wood. They need wood in their village store. They need wood to build the blueprints for buildings. They need wood to build the buildings from which the blueprints are made. At least food can be farmed eternally, but it lacks balance to say the least, and this can cause any progress to screech to a halt at points. Its belief system rewards good deeds when capturing neutral villages, but those are quickly canceled out by defense miracles when trying to take the villages of enemy gods, making it tough to capture villages without resorting to violence and destruction. The best way to capture a village without destruction isn't even shown to the player in any of its tutorials. You can have your village dance around a rock and eventually it will have a glowing red ring around it with your symbol on the top. Then you can drop it in an uncaptured village for a huge belief boost, and this coupled with missionaries is a viable way to gain villages good. It is time consuming, and with how it's not shown to the player in any tutorial, shows that there is a clear preference towards evil. I don't think the game is interested in commentary on how evil is the easy and quick way out and goodness requires patience. I think it's just half designed and unbalanced. And morality is little more than a new skin on your temple rather than a playstyle you can be evil towards your own villagers, but resources are so limited that it only hurts you since people are your best resource. Morality is a cool feature to put on the box and can be fun to roleplay with, but it is surface deep. While you have all these tools to feel like a god, you never quite feel all that powerful. The game's scope is huge, but the player's impact and the scale of it often feels small. There are limits, obviously. If I destroyed everything, I'd be the god of ashes and have no power. But outside of destroying your own buildings or slowly trying to eke out new villages or buildings, how much impact do you really have in the world of black and white? It doesn't feel like a lot. This feeling of grand idea, small execution, extends to the feature that really sets Black and White apart from other god games of the past and present, the creature. The creature is the most interesting system in the game on paper, even if it is not as intelligent as a lot of discussions on the internet would lead you to believe. And with proliferation of language learning models being masqueraded as intelligent AI, it seems topical. Black and White's creature uses a super basic reward model, I am not a developer, so bear with me here, but from a great article by James Wexler called Artificial Intelligence in Games, he explains that the creature has a number in its mind for each individual game object. Then it also assigns another number to represent its feelings about it. It then uses the belief, desire, and tension model to learn and form its own unique habits that are based on its own feelings about objects that it can form on its own or from the player. One creature might not try humans as food, and others might have figured out that your villagers are quite a tasty snack and go to those for when it's hungry, unless the player steps in. Or it's tired and thinks sleeping on the houses is very comfy, like an asshole. He desires sleep, he likes sleeping on houses, so he intends to sleep on the house. This can apply for a lot of situations. It can watch the player help villagers grow crops, and so decides to help them too. Creature eats human, pet it to encourage it, Slap to discourage. It's that simple. Give it food you want to eat and pet it to encourage it, or it will continue to eat it. You can see it throw food into the village store, pet it to encourage that, and it will. Prompts about your creature will pop up when you click it, which gives you further chances to influence it. You can teach it miracles by spamming miracles while it's around, which is a little obnoxious in my opinion. I taught mine wood, food, and healing, as I mainly like to use them to help my villagers or impress them. Though you can teach it destructive miracles too, but in my experience, they just end up becoming evil destructive monsters who destroy things you don't want them to. Their creatures can even grow over time, and if you encourage it to hold rocks, it will get super jacked really quickly. This system is a lot of fun to tinker with, and I think provides a lot of replay value if you enjoy it, but unfortunately, in the main story, these seem to be a bit of an afterthought. In fact, you can quite literally play the entire game's campaign without doing anything outside of the tutorial and quest specifically designed around your creature. Can they help you accomplish some quests a little easier? Of course, they are your means of touching the world outside the circle of your influence, but more times than not, they are either unnecessary or unhelpful. 
I mean, in lands three and five, you literally have your creature either trapped or cursed for the majority of it, which, while an attempt to make the story have some more stakes, just suffocates the amount of ways you can tackle the game. That said, there is very little consequence to not training your creature up, even in the final levels of the game. And that's not to say the creature AI isn't fun to play with. In fact, I enjoyed playing with it today, and I would even love to see a game like this with more modern technology. Though, let's be honest, I don't think we're going to get any black and white clones anytime soon. Remember how I said your impact on the world feels small? Well, the biggest impact you have is casting miracles, which is essentially a group of spells you perform with your hand. Some standard and some more tailored focused to black and white specific mechanics. These miracles are charged by worshippers, which act as a sort of speed bump to using your powers. To have enough power to use them, you have to raise a totem and have worshippers dance at your temple. But to not make this too easy, you have to feed them and keep them healthy so that your population doesn't falter. As long as the population is large and there's food at the worship site and you remember to use a healing miracle on the worshippers, you can keep churning out these bad boys all day. The full variety of miracles is pretty varied and fun. You have five classes of miracles. Resources such as food, wood, forest, and healing, and water. There's destruction, fire, thunderstorm, lightning, and mega blast. There's creature ones which make them smaller or stronger or gives them fleas as a way to impede the enemy creature. And there's a class that summons birds to impress and another one that summons wolves to attack a nearby village. And lastly, and most integrated into the gameplay of the story, is defensive class, which one is to protect from boulders and other physical objects, which seems more useful when playing against humans, along with spiritual shields for miracles, which gets heavy use in lands 4 and 5 due to a variety of environmental hazards. Most miracles have upgraded versions, which provide wider healing areas, more fireballs in one throw, and more lightning with longer range. You can even train your creature all of these, even ones like the Mega Blast, which require you to spam it like a thousand times. Yes, I'm serious. The miracles are truly the backbone of the game. The game would be completely playable if you took out the creatures with no alteration, and would still be pretty playable without the ability to expand your villages or build new ones. But everything falls apart without miracles, even if half of them you'd never actually use in regular gameplay. The enemy AI is not intelligent enough to actually be a threat, so defensive miracles are only useful against environmental hazards and in the long dead multiplayer against other real players. The destructive spells provide you with the ability to get aggressive taking villages or destroying them, fire spreads and lightning kills villagers quickly, the resource miracles allow you to keep your villagers happy and expanding with food, wood, and healing, as well as the water which lets you grow your crops, grow your trees, or put out any fires that you or the enemy may set. Miracles are a lot of fun and are the best example of giving the player the illusion of godhood, but are as unbalanced and half thought out as the rest of the game is. As I said, there is the illusion of choice in the mechanics, but in practice, your main option is to play aggressively and to take villages fast. To be fair to Lionhead though, much of what has been promised has made it into the final game. It's very rare you can be this ambitious and know exactly what will work the best the first try around. And all things considered, it feels coherent and can be fun at points, even if the feeling of fun does fade off eventually. While the ambitions of the mechanics have paid off to a point, unfortunately for Lionhead, they weren't as ambitious with the story as I would have liked. Now, enough with the tangents. Let's get right into the story. When you open the game for the first time, it opens properly with the kid running into the ocean against his parents' wishes. There's sharks in the water, and the parents start praying for a god to save them. And then you get this really awesome pre-rendered cutscene that shows how gods are born and travel through the cosmos to reach the planet. Change eternity. That god is you. <laughs>
music or a curse? Good or evil? Be what you will, you are destiny. If you've played Fable, you might recognize the narrator as the same voice actor who voices the Guildmaster. The music is also done by the same composer as Fable, Russell Shaw. This cutscene is a great showcase of how great the soundtrack is. Russell Shaw states his love for ambient techno being an influence on the sound, and it really shows. It sounds godly with its heavy use of choirs and long, drawn-out synth lines, with certain tracks featuring techno-influenced percussion. One of the main ambient pieces is accented by different instruments depending on the culture of the village and the alignment of your god. And I really adore this soundtrack. So here's a sample of some of my favorite tracks, and I've already put the soundtrack in the description, so you should check it out if you like it. the cutscene is over, you pick up the child and give him back to the parents who ask to take you back to their village to be worshipped. You then get introduced to your conscience who act as the devil and angel on your shoulders and will give you advice based on the good or evil things that you do. They also act as guides and will chime in when there is something that needs your attention in one of your villages. They're the voices you'll hear the most and never outstay their welcome and add some personality to the game that would be very missed without their presence. Greetings, we're your conscience. Good and evil, yin and yang, black and white. As part of you, we'll guide you through this world. You then get subjected to a bunch of tutorials to start showcasing black and white's controls, which are interesting. It can be completely controlled by mouse and works pretty well if that's your thing. And for laptop users, it even works pretty good on a trackpad. The movement tutorial itself is pretty painful and holds your, pardon my pun, hand a bit too much. Line had realized this and patched a way in to skip to various points of the tutorial when you start a new game. The rest are a little more sensible, such as introducing you to resource mechanics and especially the creature tutorials. To allow the player the freedom to tackle the story at their own pace, though, they locked progression behind gold story scrolls, which, when you click, progresses the story and gives players new objectives and quests. While it does take a while for the game to truly open up and let you cook, that really won't be until the next world, it does gradually give you more freedom to play around. The most consuming tutorial in this world is the creature tutorial. Your creature is trained by a creature trainer, which teaches you the different leashes, which causes your creature to behave differently, a mean one, a nice one, and a learning one, which gives you a boost in learning when you're trying to show them new behaviors or miracles. You will, however, eventually meet a massive creature known to you as the guide. He will teach you how to take other villages by performing miracles, and will teach your creature how to fight. Before we continue with him, let me go over the side quest system, or as it's known here, Silver Reward Scrolls. These are mostly inconsequential, but offer tiny rewards like new creatures, miracle dispensers, or new miracles at the village. My favorite one in the game being these guys with their huge bow over here, and they sing a jaunty tune. Oh, we got this notion that we quite like to sell the ocean, so we're building a big boat to leave here for good. We're not keen on sinking, so we're all sitting here thinking, cause we built it too big and we've run out of wood. I lightly, I lightly, we simply can't leave till we get some more wood. Sinking, so that's why we're sitting thinking Cause we simply can't leave till we get some more wood How dare they leave after all we've done for them What have we done for them exactly? Perhaps we should help them out, it might be nice You give them grain, you give them wood and you give them meat And they venture off to another land and it won't be the last time you see them 
Now back to the main story. When you reach his last gold story scroll, you learn about his previous owner, Nemesis, as I mentioned previously, who you need to protect yourself from and get enough creeds to survive. Right after this, Nemesis comes, kills the guide, and a portal opens up, ushering you to the next land as the current land is being destroyed with lightning and fire. When you enter the new land, you meet other gods like the ally named Kazar, who opened the portal for you and will aid you in this land, as well as an enemy named Alethis, who allies with Nemesis in the hope of protecting himself from Nemesis's wrath. And other than that, there's really no characterization for anyone you meet in the game. There's not much to the story, but for a sandbox-style god game, it's serviceable. Land 2 Stories is made up of further tutorials from Kazar, in, which includes the gesture system, which allows you to call for miracles just using little symbols that you draw with your hand, as well as the village workshop system, which allows you to build new buildings in your village. This is where the game is at its most open, without specific objectives, as you have to battle Lethys for his villages to progress. You were allowed to tackle this task without limitations, and I ended up using poisoned grain from a side quest to slowly destroy the populations of Lethus's villages so that I could repopulate them with my own believing villagers. When you take enough of Lethus's villages, Nemesis comes in and reveals that he already has three creeds and blows Kazar off the face of Eden. Lethus, my ally, you have failed me. I, Nemesis, have arrived to take control. But I will not let them threaten my destiny. I will be the only god. Kazar, you have defied me for the last time. Nemesis! No! Kazar, I know your creature hides a part of the creed inside him. I do not need it. I already have the power that three combined creeds bring. And I will use it to destroy you. Lethus then takes your creature and runs off to another land. You can either race off into the portal underprepared, or wait and take his villages to destroy his temple, where another portal then opens up where you can load up on resources before the next land. From this point on, the game's difficulty rises and also becomes more limiting mechanically. There are more specific solutions to problems, and without your creature in this land, you lose a whole essential mechanic of the game. While this could be a cool test of the other systems, there really are limited ways to capture villages. There's miracle spamming for hours to get enough belief, killing every villager and replacing them, or my favorite, exploiting glitches. Whichever way you choose to proceed when you do manage to capture a village, let this will send some sort of script the disaster to this newly captured village. The first village, a burning set of people which you have to either use a water miracle which is slow, or just tossing them in the water to douse the flames. The second village you capture, he sends a wolf pact, which if one single wolf manages to reach the village, you lose the village and it sets you back with a pretty high amount of belief needed to recapture it. So what was I to do? I needed my creature back, and the only way to get him back is to capture those villages. Well, the developers dropped a golden ticket on my lap. This guy right here is invincible and insults you at- Get off! Get off! Oh, you big bully! Try it again and you're dead. But most importantly, he has a small ring of influence where you can pick him up anywhere. So I set his ass up at Lethus's temple, somehow got him stuck, and just kept dropping fire ox on top of his temple, which destroyed all of his villages. Mission accomplished. Lethus begs for his life, then dies because I accidentally killed every villager. I get my creature and a creed to go through yet another portal. In the fourth land, there are no gods. And that's because it's just the first land that has been cursed by Nemesis. And to uncurse it, you have to disable these guardian stones to cancel each curse. 
This land is all puzzle-based. The first puzzle is basically a game of Simon. Another is to win a fight against an ogre. And the final one is to help a villager whose wife is being forced in another village and will die if he proclaims belief in any god but Nemesis. Unfortunately, my creature ate his wife when I was bringing her back over to him, so sorry, man. You've killed my soulmate. Nemesis promised to protect her. Take the stone. I've got no faith left in anything. <laughs> Killing! It's the answer to ev There is a village of skeletons here that needs both their totem poles raised at the same time to turn them back into humans. You just need to get your creature to do the other one, and then boom, you get a creed from the corpse of the guide, and you're invited by Nemesis to the final land. Once you arrive, Nemesis welcomes you to the land, commends your strength, and then the perspective shifts to the longest, most awkward cutscene of the game. Find your creature is different since I cursed him. <laughs> your creature is now cursed, and the only way to save him is again take the villages away from Nemesis. One plus is that the boat guys remember them. Well, they founded a village on Nemesis's land, and you get a free Norse Wonder already built, which comes in handy later, especially since wood miracles are so scarce. This land is where black and white's issues really come to the forefront. I already mentioned my qualms with the creature on this land as far as him wandering away and getting your own villages destroyed by Nemesis's creature, but this land took me literally half of my playthrough because of this. The first village is easy, all I have to do is take down a shield. The next village, though, leaves you with few options. If you send your creature there, Nemesis hurts him, and his creature runs to my village to destroy everyone. If I try to use heals or flock miracles, he puts up a shield which cancels the belief gain. So what does that mean? It means I go to Old Reliable, of course. Kill everyone and put my own villagers in. Easy peasy. Nemesis proclaims, though, that if he can't have the wonders, then nobody can, which made me feel like I needed them to win, but you really don't. But whatever, wonders are useful and improve the power of your miracles. Problem is that this is the only village with a wood miracle, and there are no trees nearby. So it took a while to get a big enough population to reconstruct the village and to get that miracle due to the constant targeting by Nemesis since it was within his ring of influence. I mostly get the curse dealt with after two much easier village captured, including one that Nemesis just mysteriously destroyed on his own. And then Nemesis just starts dropping Mega Blasts all over the map, which are easy to avoid, but absolutely annoying to listen to. I start killing and attacking his last village since I'm tired of him, and once I send my one missionary, my creature fights his creature, I kick his ass, and then my creature has to go into the volcano to combine the creeds to fully vanquish Nemesis, which looks pretty silly.
our noble friend, gone. But can you feel the difference? I can feel even a trace of Nemesis' influence. Everything is clear. You're the one true god now. Crikey, what was that? Hang on. I recognize that smell. He's back. He doesn't look too hot, though. Maybe we can fix him up. Miracle Hero. Increase. Come on. We're meant to be bad. And Nemesis is dead. I get this nice little cutscene with all the unique NBCs in the game with fireworks and then it's over. For being late in development, the story is alright. But you could basically ignore it and be fine. If it weren't for the atmosphere from the soundtrack, sound design, and the assets, it would be far worse off. And it really goes to show how far the little details go into creating a compelling experience. While that's the meat of the game, there are a few extra modes to talk about. There are a couple modes here. The first one being Skirmish, which allows you to play up to three different AI gods, with the goal being to vanquish them and to take over the realm. There are a bunch of villages, especially on the larger four god maps, with some being more valuable than others due to their proximity to the enemy's temples and having stronger miracles. I find that the god AI isn't good enough to make this truly compelling or challenging, but it can be fun if you enjoyed the second land where you're not as tied to objectives or hazards meant to make the game more challenging. Multiplayer is no longer online due to it running on GameSpy servers that were shut down many, many years ago. But there are still ways to play either through LAN connection or using a software like Hamachi to trick the game into thinking the online game is a LAN connection. It works pretty well, and these skirmishes shine when you're playing against real opponents instead of AI who are so limited. So if you manage to find some players to play with it, do it. Hell, I might be interested too, so comment if you want to play with me, I guess. Black and White, despite its flaws, was very well received at launch. Before Metacritic deleted the page for it, it was sitting at a 90. Those reviews across the board praised the unique creature mechanics and the ambitious gameplay, though even some of the most positive reviews admit to the game losing steam towards the end. Eventually the hype faded, and the general consensus even from those favorable reviewers was that the game was flawed and did not hold up to further scrutiny after the initial wow factor wore off. And I tend to agree with this assessment. It's not fair to say it's a bad game, though, because it's not. It comes from an era where ambitious ideas were still given larger budgets and backing from publishers like EA. I love that ambition and philosophy, and it leads to some fun moments, especially in sandbox and multiplayer in the early parts of the campaign. But it does get dragged down by a lack of bounds and being able to convert villages. The game is just often too easy. And while the classic response to this complaint is, just make the game harder for yourself, I think that's a cop-out. It is up to the developers to make all mechanics viable if that is the goal. And it is clear that Lion had had time to create the tools, but not the time to fine-tune them in a way that allows for multiple playstyles. Even when it does attempt to branch out with quest design, it ends up falling flat and not taking advantage of the very mechanics it advertises itself on, like morality and the creature, and instead relies on basic puzzles you could find in an educational game. The narrative in the following years would call it overrated, and it appeared on multiple such lists, as once the hype wore off, it struggled to hold up to the further scrutiny. And unfortunately, it would eventually fall into relative obscurity due to never being released digitally. The guys at Noclip did a great documentary on this that goes into the legalities of why this happened. Mostly coming down to EA having the publishing rights and Microsoft owning Lionhead and its IPs. Which means that without a high demand, they are unlikely to come to a legal deal that would get the game released, even with attempts by the guys at GOG to make this happen. I'll link that documentary in the description as well. Lionhead were aware of the criticism of the game and got to work on an expansion pack called Creature Isle that would attempt to address the lack of depth of the creatures part of the game. Does it succeed at that? Well, I guess we'll just have to find out next time. Thanks for watching.